Well, this evening uh, we're returning to 1 John, at least um, to complete this particular uh, topic. <coughs> One thing that <coughs> we need to see about 1 John is it does have a, um, a dual purpose. Its, its purpose is to uh, be, as, as it were, a mirror that we can look at through its uh, various marks that it gives to us of the grace of God and how it works in our lives so that we can tell that we really do belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, it also tells us what we ought to be like and what we ought to be striving for because whatever the Spirit of God works in our hearts is something that we also are involved in, something we need to cooperate with. Uh, we do know that the new birth is something that comes sovereignly from the Lord, something that He does alone. But we know that sanctification is something we are also involved in. So these marks are also things that we ought to be uh, striving for as well. So what I'd like to do is um, look at that striving part of it mainly uh, as we look at uh, this evening, 1 John 2, verses 1 through <coughs> 11. <coughs> Excuse me. John, uh, John writes this, My little children... I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this portion of his uh, word to our growth in grace uh, this evening. Now remember we saw this morning uh, the very obvious fact that no Christian is perfect Every believer sins, we all sin. I've been talking a lot about sin today, but that's, um, the Bible talks about sin. We need to come to grips with it. John tells us if we don't think that we have sinned, uh, so that we don't think we need Jesus Christ as a Savior, or that we don't continue to sin so that we don't need to repent. He says we're only deceiving ourselves. God's truth has not been applied to our hearts in a saving way by His Holy Spirit. We're also calling God a liar because He tells us that both of these things are true. We have sinned, we still continue to sin. Now John's point is this, that, that even as believers, we still have a war going on in our hearts between the flesh and the Spirit. When the desire of the flesh wins out over that of the Spirit, we sin. If that wasn't true, John wouldn't have written what he wrote uh, regarding this. But if it wasn't true, then we also would not need to continually be confessing our sins, as he told us this morning uh, that we should, and that we continually need to receive God's merciful forgiveness, which he gives to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. If it wasn't true, at least some of us wouldn't need to do this. Remember, we were looking at the fact that the Bible does not teach perfectionism. If it did then John could distinguish. Well, this is for some of you, but not for all of you. But this is a mark that we belong to the Lord, that we're confessing our sins, that we recognize that we do sin, and we're continually confessing them as we continually receive his mercy. Now, John goes on now to tell us why it is that he 
wrote these things. It, it was not to give us an excuse to sin, but rather to show us the reality of our sin, that it's real, it's there, so that we'll turn from it to Jesus and that we'll push on to become more like him. This evening, he tells us that the reason why the Father sent Jesus into the world in the first place was to destroy the power of sin in our lives so that we wouldn't sin. He sent him so that we might become like him, not like the world, but like Jesus, who is much different than the world. And he sent him that he might be our advocate so that he might stand up for us in heaven when we fall so that we might eventually make it to heaven. You need to realize, as I'm sure you do, that we don't make it to heaven on our own. The work that's going on in us isn't taking place only on earth by the Holy Spirit. It's also taking place in heaven through the uh, advocacy, the intercession of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at those three points uh, this evening. Now John tells us, first of all, the Father sent his Son into the world in order that he might destroy sin. He makes it very clear that he did not write what he wrote in chapter 1 to give us an excuse to sin. God's work of redemption is meant to free us from sin. He writes in verse 1 of our text, My little children, I am writing these things, the things that are yet to come as well as the things he's already said, I am writing these things to you <clears throat> so that you may not sin. John almost seems to be concerned here that maybe some would take what he has just written and twist it and use it as a reason to sin rather than as a reason not to sin. If it's true that all believers sin, which is what he's told us in chapter 1, and yet we still have some measure of fellowship with God and so are eventually going to go to heaven, then why should we go through the hard work of putting our sins to death? You know, as I thought about this, I, I thought about how uh, in, in the world we kind of face this same sort of dilemma uh, or problem when it comes to um, maybe hiring people to do ki different kinds of work. Have you ever noticed that when you pay somebody to do a job and you give them the money before they complete their work, how difficult it can be sometimes to get them actually to finish that work. Sometimes the work never actually gets done. Now, the people who are honest and people who are just will certainly do it, but there's a lot of people who, who lose the incentive to get the work done. The incentive is gone. They already have what they were hoping to gain through their work, so why work any further? There was actually a member uh, of the church years ago who uh, had his own business, uh, developing apps for different businesses that would work on your, you know, your Android tablet or on your phone and so forth. And as a part of the process of creating this app, he actually had to give them the finished product and let them put it into use so they could try it for their own satisfaction before they were to pay him. Now, the one problem that kept coming up over and over again was that after he did this and gave them a functional app that was already in service, that they were very reluctant to pay him. And the reason why was because they already had the finished product. Now, the same thing can happen in God's kingdom. If we know that the Lord has already given to us heaven through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we already know that we have the reward, it can tempt us not to do the hard work of fighting and overcoming our sins. I mean, have you ever been tempted to do that? Have you ever thought since I'm on my way to heaven that maybe it doesn't really matter. I've seen a number of believers that live this way and certainly I think all of us are tempted to it. Now John wants to make it clear in our text that that is not an option for the believer. What he wrote in chapter 1 was meant to do two things. It was meant to convict those who denied their sins of their sins so that they might come to Jesus and it was meant to comfort those who struggle with sin so that they would be able to understand what it was they were going through that you can still be imperfect and still be loved by the Lord and still be on your way to heaven. But it wasn't meant to encourage sin. 
Now, John goes on to tell us a little bit later in this letter that the reason why the Father sent his Son into the world in the first place was to rectify this in the lives of his people, to undo what the devil has done. Not to advance his work, but to destroy his work. We read in 1 John 3, verses 5 through 8, You know that he, that is Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And notice this, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy what the devil has done to us. Um, remember when the devil succeeded in getting Adam and Eve to listen to him rather than to God, two things happened. Adam and Eve became guilty and they became corrupt. They became guilty because they sinned. They became corrupt because in their sin they lost the Spirit of God. Now, Adam's guilt, as we know in the Scripture, also became ours because he represented us in the garden. And with the guilt that comes from that representation, which is credited to us, which is imputed to us, also comes the corruption. His sin, which is our sin, forfeited the Spirit's work in us. And that's why we come into the world in the condition we're in, guilty and on our way to judgment, and corrupt, wanting nothing to do with God or his law. This is what Jesus came to undo. He undid it by taking our guilt on himself and suffering in our place on the cross. Notice John says that he himself is the propitiation for our sins. He says that in verse 2. What it means is that he satisfied through his sufferings, he satisfied God's justice. God's justice demands a payment for the crimes committed against him. Jesus paid that payment. He made that payment on the cross by suffering. That's how he made the payment. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died. He suffered and died on the cross. He paid the price just and demanded so that we could be freed from justice. And by obeying his Father's law perfectly, I should say judgment, not justice, by obeying his Father's law perfectly, he not only gave us that perfect record of obedience we need to enter into heaven, but he also purchased the Holy Spirit, that return of the Spirit which Adam forfeited, that he might give the Spirit of God to us, that the Spirit of God might give to us a new heart, that he might give us new affections so that we would love God and hate sin. Jesus undoes what the devil did. He destroys the works of the devil. And now that Jesus has done this, now that he's given us the new record, now that he's given us the new heart, now that he's taken away our sins, John wants us to know that we will not live as we lived before. We will no longer be the slaves of sin, but the slaves of righteousness, which means now we can and will live like Jesus. Now, one of the ways, John tells us, that we can know that we have come savingly to the Lord Jesus Christ is the fact that we do live like him. Listen to what he says in verses 3 through 6 of our passage. By this we know that we have come to know him in a saving way, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. And what John means by that is that that work of the Holy Spirit, which is to produce this love, it's come to its conclusion. It's come to its completion. Now we are loving the way that the Lord calls us to love. Now he goes on to say this, by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now, at first glance, 
I don't know if you noticed this, but there does seem to be a bit of a contradiction here that I think we need to clear up. And I think as we do, we're going to have a better understanding of what John is saying because it almost seems like he's saying, contradicting in, in this statement, what he actually, or what he told us this morning in the first chapter. This morning we heard him say this in chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. In verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But now we see him saying in chapter 2, verse 4, the one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So this is essentially what, what John is saying. On the one hand, if we say we have no sin, that we don't break the commandments, the truth is not in us. Okay, so in other words, if we say that we obey all the time, then, then we, the truth is not in us. We're basically lying and calling God a liar. On the other hand, if we break the commandments, which is what we're doing, if we do not keep them, the truth is not in us. So which is it? You know, is it if we say we keep the commandments or if we say we, we don't, you know, that, that we uh, break the commandments, the truth isn't going to be in us one way or the other. Now, we, we of course need to understand that both of these things are true, but we need to understand in what sense they're both true because this is the difference between the converted and the unconverted when it comes to sin. Now, if we are true believers, John tells us we will still sin. As we saw this morning, we're not yet perfect. We still have corruption in our souls. And because we do, we will still think and desire and speak and do things that are sinful. Because we don't love God yet as we should. As we're really called to in the commandments with our whole being. And again, the difference between those, you know, wh how we ought to love him and how we actually do love him is sin. But since we do love him to some degree because of the Spirit's work in our souls, when we sin, we will not sin with a whole heart. We'll always be fighting against that sin to some degree. We won't give ourselves to it. As John tells us, we won't practice sin. Now, we saw John write in 1 John 3, verse 6. We read that, I think, this morning and this evening. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. John explains what he means by that in verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Christians sin. They're imperfect. But they don't practice sin. That's the difference. The unbeliever practices sin. Christians don't. Now, practicing sin is not the same thing as falling into particular sins. There's a difference. And again, it has to do with how much of the heart is actually engaged in it. The Puritans believe that every single believer, that each one of us has one or more particular sins called besetting sins that we are liable to, that we often fall into, sins that we will have to struggle against all of our lives, sometimes gaining some victory over, sometimes losing to it. I think we know from our own experience that what the Puritans say said is right. We all struggle with sin, with particular sins. Now, John isn't talking here when he says practicing sin about the sins we struggle with because of our imperfection. He's talking about the practice of giving into sin without a fight, where there is no struggle, but only the desire for that sin. I hope you see the, the difference between those things. When a, when a believer sins, he sins against his will. He really wants to do what is pleasing to the Lord, but he's weak and he falls into sin. The person who practices sin isn't struggling with it. He gives himself to it because that's what he wants. That's all he wants. There's no struggle. Now, John is telling us that if, if that is our experience, the practice of sin, giving ourselves into sin, 
and not struggling against it, giving ourselves to it with our whole heart, it shows that we do not have the Spirit because if we did, that love He's given us, that desire to do what is right would create a struggle in our souls against the desire for what is wrong. There would be a fight. True believers sin, but they never give themselves fully to any sin because we love God. So again, that's the difference. I hope you can see the difference between those two things, okay? But John goes on to say if we love God, we do more than just not practice sin. We actually practice righteousness where the unbeliever gives himself whole, wholeheartedly to sin. We give ourselves to practice righteousness, again, with that mixed imperfection that we were talking about. But that is the stronger desire in us, at least it is normally. He says in chapter 2, verse 3, by this we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. He says in verses 5 and 6, whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And then in chapter 3, verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. John is saying rather than practicing the breaking of the law, we'll practice obedience, we'll obey it. We'll give ourselves to what it tells us to do. We will love God and we will love our neighbor because that is what we will want to do. Now, John goes on to tell us that there's one thing in particular, and actually this is something that tends to come up again and again in Scripture. One thing in particular that that love will move us to do that shows that we are true believers, the failure of which to do shows that we are not true believers, and that is we will love the brethren. Because that's what Jesus did. We'll, we'll walk as he walked. Jesus loved his people. He laid down his life for his sheep, for his people. He came into the world for them. That is what we will do as well. We will lay down our lives as he laid down his life to the brethren. This is what John says in verses 7 through 11 of our text. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? You know, the one thing about what John writes is it almost seems to be a bit obscure. It's like he's speaking in figurative language. I don't know if you've noticed that in John's gospel, but it's true there as well as in his letters. Sometimes we have to do a little bit of thinking. It's clearly, or it should say it's simply stated, but it's not altogether clear. So what does he mean by this? Well, the commandment that John is referring to here, which is in one sense old, but in another new, is the command to love our neighbor. Excuse me, well, it's really to love our brother. It's old in the sense that it's the same commandment that Jesus gave to his disciples in John 13, 34 which at the time of the writing of 1 John would have been about 40 years or so earlier from the time that Jesus gave that commandment, not from the time of the writing of that gospel, but from the time Jesus actually said these things. Jesus says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, even then, there was a sense in which the commandment that Jesus gave to his disciples was, was an old commandment because the Lord taught them in the old covenant that they were to do this very thing. Among the community of Israel, they were to love their neighbor as they loved themselves. And, of course, in the community of Israel, those neighbors were your brothers most of the time. But Jesus also says it was new 
Jesus was giving a new meaning to this commandment through his own example. And this is something that Sinclair Ferguson actually talked about in one of the series we were going through. I think the one on the Sermon on the Mount where the golden rule, remember, is treat others the way you want them to treat you. The way we should really understand that commandment is treat others the way that Jesus has treated you. Jesus, in fulfilling this commandment by loving us in the way that we should love, has given us an example to follow. He's given new meaning to this commandment. That's the sense in which it is new. Love one another even as I have loved you. But there's still another sense, John tells us, in which this old commandment is a new commandment. He says, when the light of the Spirit of God comes into our hearts and he drives out the darkness that was there so that we begin to see what true love is, then we begin to love as Jesus loved. We begin to love those that belong to him, just as Jesus loves them. So I'm giving you a new commandment, which is really not a new commandment, but an old commandment, the one that was given to you from the beginning, and that is that you should love your neighbor and love your brother, actually, as Jesus has loved you. We can do that now because of the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts, because of the light that drives out the darkness, because we're walking in the light with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the power to love. We have the power to obey. But again, let's not forget what we saw this morning in closing, and that is that that love that we have is still going to be imperfect. We're still going to sin. But the good news is that when we sin, the Lord is going to stand up for us in heaven and advocate on our behalf. John writes in 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. John says that when we fail, we do have somebody in heaven who stands up for us. One thing that's interesting is that the word that John uses here for advocate is the word parakletos, which is the same word Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit. Remember how Jesus told his disciples, it's important for you that I leave and go to heaven, because if I go to heaven, if I leave, I will send the comforter, I will send the parakletos, I will send the helper, the comforter, the one who will take my place and do on earth what I was doing for you. Well, just as Jesus has gone to heaven in order to send the Spirit to us so that we might have this help, he goes into heaven essentially to do the same thing for us there. I mentioned earlier that we often think about the work that's going on as, as the Spirit of God working in us and through us in, in this life, but we need to realize that there is somebody in heaven also working on our behalf, and that is the Lord Jesus. John says he now stands before God on our behalf to plead the merit of his sacrifice, a sacrifice that propitiation which he says was not just for the Jews, but it was for the whole world. It was for the Gentiles as well. We know how the gospel you know, changes, the new, the new covenant changes. In the old covenant, it was still true that whoever joined themselves to the people of the Lord would be saved if they're trusting in the one who was coming, but they had to come to Israel in order for that to take place, and they actually had to become a Jew to join themselves to the people of God or at least become a God-fearer. But now we don't have to become God-fearers. Now we don't have to come to Israel. Uh, we have the Lord Jesus sending the gospel out to all the nations because the sacrifice that he has made is for the whole world, for all people, for Gentiles as well as Jews, which means it is also for us. Jesus pleads the merits of his sacrifice before the Father, when we fail. And that's what keeps us in the grace of God, and that's what guarantees that we're going to make it to heaven. So John's point is essentially this. Yes, it is true that we are imperfect. We still sin. But we no longer practice sin because the power of sin is broken. The entrance of the Holy Spirit has changed that. We no longer give ourselves to sin with a whole heart, but we fight against it now because of the work of Jesus. He has overcome the work of the devil 
in our hearts. He has cleansed us of our guilt. He has broken the power of sin. And even though we may fall many times, our sins will not destroy us because we have an advocate who will bring us to heaven, one who appears before God on our behalf, the Lord Jesus Christ. The evidence, of course, that we have this going on for us in heaven, the fact that the power of sin has been broken, is that we now practice righteousness. In particular, like Jesus, we love our brethren. Now, Jesus says in John 13, 35, something that we really need to pay attention to. He says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, one of the reasons why the church is not able to give the witness that it should to the world is because we oftentimes don't love the brethren. I mean, that happens even within one church, but also the way that one church or denomination might treat another church or denomination. You know, where is the love? It's, it's lacking. We need this unified face of love towards our brethren uh, throughout the world in order to bring the witness that Jesus wants us to give. He put his light in us. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we might become like him and shine his light into the world so that others might come to know him. And one of the main ways in which we shine is by expressing that love to the brethren. And so we need to let that light shine. We need to yield to the Spirit of God. We need to live like the Lord Jesus Christ and love our brethren as he did. By this, Jesus says, the world will know that we belong to him. And through this, we'll also bring the witness he wants to the world that will vindicate and verify the truth of the gospel. So may the Lord give us the grace uh, to yield to the Spirit and to walk in the commandments and to love our brethren as he calls us to, to love them. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to give us the grace uh, to do that.